I want to bring in now a man who was up very, very late last night, 2020 contender and Colorado Senator Michael Bennett on the stage last night. Uh, Senator, thank you for joining me this morning. I wanted you on at this very moment because I believe you heard our last segment. The president joking with Vladimir Putin, possibly accepting an invitation to a party in Russia. When you were on the stage, you made it very clear that if you, you view Russia as the greatest geopolitical threat to the United States at this moment. So what is your reaction to the meeting that you just saw? I, I think it's pitiful. I, I, I don't understand why Donald Trump feels the need to coddle these dictators in Russia and North Korea. I don't understand why, I mean, I guess I do understand, I've, I know it's tragic that he doesn't care about freedom of the press either. And, you know, his response to the murder of Khashoggi by the Saudis uh, really is one of the most pathetic things in his presidency. Uh, but the, the real point here is that Russia interfered with our elections, and not just our elections, but all throughout Western Europe as well. And if you talk to ambassadors from that part of the world, they will tell you how fearful they are of Russia's interference, both in terms of uh, social media, but also trying to prop up these racist right-wing parties uh, in Europe that are a threat to democracy there and a potential threat to democracy here. And to see the President of the United States on foreign soil do this kind of stuff at the same time that he's insulting our allies at the G20 is pitiful. Uh, Vladimir, I mean, it's embarrassing is what it is. Uh, I want to stay on, well, possibly embarrassing. Uh, President Trump had other meetings while in Osaka. He had a meeting with Japan's Shinzo Abe, and I want to share a bit of it. We're going to be talking about many things, and we can also be talking about a lot of trade. I appreciate the fact that you're sending many automobile companies into Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and North Carolina, a lot of our states. Uh, I see they're building all over the United States, a lot of the great Japanese car companies and other Japanese companies also, but in particular, the car companies have been uh, terrific. They're coming in and they're building magnificent plants. We haven't had that, and uh, we very much appreciate it. Senator, what is the president talking about? He's saying to Shinzo Abe, you are sending many beautiful Japanese car companies to the United States. He's, he's mentioning several states and saying you're building these fantastic plants that wasn't happening before. What is he talking about? Yeah, I, I, honestly, I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, we're going to have to see as the months go on whether these promises turn out to be something that turn out to be true or not. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. He, you see the guys that, in Ohio, the auto workers that have lo lost their jobs since he's been president. He, you know, he said, he said, don't sell your house. Everything's going to be OK. I don't I really don't understand it. I, and I can't comment on it. Uh, let's talk about the debate stage. The clearest Beyond divide, that. even in the last two nights, yeah. seems to be about health care. Help us understand specifically where you stand. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren making the argument to do away with private health care. Yesterday, I spoke to John Delaney. He said, if that is the route Democrats take, they will lose the election to the president by nine points. I don't know if it'll be nine points, but it's going to be really, really hard for us to win. I'm for universal health care coverage. We should have it in this country. And I think given the fact that we have an existing health care system, uh, that the best way to do that is to give everybody a public option. Mine is called Medicare X, which would give every family the opportunity to buy, buy a, a plan administered by Medicare if that's what they want instead of private insurance. And if private insurance <coughs> turns it out to be as terrible as Bernie says it is, I think lots of people would migrate to the public option. I might migrate to the public option. What I think is impossible is the idea that we're going to take insurance away from 180 million people. Stephanie, I know you'll remember back when President Obama was the president, we were passing the Affordable Care Act. He said, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. And a few hundred thousand or maybe a million people lost their insurance because it didn't meet the basic requirements of the Affordable Care Act. And politically, that was devastating. Here we're saying, if you like your insurance, we're going to take it away from you. And you can't win a Senate race in Colorado being for Medicare for all. And I'd be surprised if you could win one in Arizona or in North Carolina. 
And my concern is that we need a, a, a presidential candidate at the top of the ticket, I hope that will be me, that is also concerned about winning a majority back in the Senate, because we desperately need to do that. And I think we have an incredible opportunity here to do it. We've got a tough map, it's true, but it is possible for us to do it, particularly given where Donald Trump's numbers might be. But if our policy as Democrats is that we have to take insurance away from millions and millions of people before we can give it to others. If our policy as Democrats are, if you're a steel worker and you've negotiated year after year for your health care benefits, but the Democratic Party is going to take it away from you, we will lose. Let's talk and that's that I think there's a lot at stake here. I want to talk immigration for a moment because last night you said the situation at the border has become a symbol of nativist hostility. What do you say to those Americans who say they're not hostile, but they themselves are suffering? Their kids aren't going to good schools. They've lost their job. They don't have Wi-Fi where they live. They don't have hospitals to go to. Yeah, well, what I say to them is, and this is another discussion last night, is that since 2001, we've cut taxes in this country by $5 trillion. Almost all the benefit of that has gone to the wealthiest people in America. We have spent $5.6 trillion in wars in the Middle East. That's 11 or $12 trillion that we could have invested here at home creating jobs for people and infrastructure, building the kind of high-speed inter uh, internet that you're talking about, putting in place the addiction treatment that we need. And instead, we lit that money on fire. And the American people do deserve much better than that. And by the way, on the, on the point about uh, a symbol of nativist hostility, you know, I was part of the Gang of Eight that wrote the immigration bill in 2013 that created a pathway to citizenship for 11 million people that had the most progressive DREAM Act ever written. It also had in it $46 billion of border security. That's far more than Donald Trump has asked for for his ineffective wall, for effective 21st century border security that would see every inch of the border. So I, I think we're in a world right now where Donald Trump is inhabiting an alternative alternative universe. And he is making up a bunch of facts about uh, the way the world actually works. I think it's incumbent on people like me to go to the people that you're talking about in, in this country and say, there really is a better choice here that's going to be able to create investments in communities that have been ignored for too long by Democrats and Republicans we can start to bring this country together, which we need to do. Senator, please stay with me. We have breaking news out of the Supreme Court about immigration right now. Let's turn to my colleague, Pete Williams. Pete, what's going on? Well, the Supreme Court has agreed after having this case on the uh, list for since last fall that it will take up the government's appeal over the DACA case. This is the so-called uh, uh, Dreamers case. This is for young people who were brought to the United States by their parents and have been allowed to stay in the country, an Obama administration program. Remember that President Trump tried to shut it down, and that effort has been blocked by the lower courts, and that's what the Trump administration has appealed. And today, the Supreme Court said it will take up those appeals. That means that it's not going to hear this case until the fall. And then whatever it rules on DACA will undoubtedly be part of the presidential election campaign. Now, as a practical matter, this means that the DACA program can continue at least for several more months, probably through the end of the year. I can't imagine the Supreme Court will decide this case much before early 2020. Now, there are just a couple of other things to tell you about here. The court also said it will hear a question about aid to religious schools. This has been a very big deal. Uh, this is a case that comes from Montana, a state program that was set up, gives you a tax credit if you contribute to a scholarship fund, and the money could be used for parents who want to send their children to private schools. The state said, but you can't use the money for religious schools because of the state constitution. The Supreme Court will hear that appeal. And one other thing here, the Supreme Court has turned down an appeal in an abortion case. This one was from Alabama. It would have basically banned one of the most commonly used procedures after the 15 weeks of pregnancy in the second trimester. This was passed before the current wave of harsh anti-abortion measures. It was passed two, uh, 2016, I think. Uh, and the Supreme Court said it will not hear that case. That leaves in place lower court orders that ban that law. So three big developments here, Stephanie.
All right, Pete, thank you so much. I want to go back to the senator. Senator, that is a positive uh, for those who are pro-Dreamers and the DACA program. Yeah, we, 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 one of the things Donald Trump said when he was running was that uh, he would be supportive of the Dreamers, and, and, and instead he's made their lives even more difficult than they were before. So I hope the Supreme Court um, can see it uh, in the law to, to make sure that we protect them. Ninety percent of the American people believe that they should have a pathway to citizenship. And um, notwithstanding that, the Trump White House left them out of their immigration plan because they said it would be too divisive to include them. So I, I you know, having been a school superintendent in Denver, I know how on um, tender hooks everybody is because of what the president has done. And I hope one way or another this ends up with them getting the relief that they need. Senator, I know we have to wrap up. Do you, you mentioned the president has created this alternative universe, uh, telling people the world is a certain way and it isn't. Before we go, those who feel that they're not getting taken care of in their town, their city, their school, many are under the impression that if we build a wall or if we are anti-immigrant, then more money will go to them. Given what's currently going on, there are still billions and billions of dollars going to the border. It's just not being spent well. Isn't that the case? Exactly, exactly. And remember I mentioned the, the Gang of Eight bill, there was the immigration bill in 2013 that had $46 billion in border security. That entire $46 billion was paid by fees on immigrants. It wasn't the U.S. taxpayer, and it obviously wasn't Mexico because they were never going to pay for the wall. Those were fees based on, 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 on those, those were immigration fees. In addition to that, it, the bill actually was scored by the CBO to reduce the budget deficit because you were bringing people out of the shadows and they were going to have to pay taxes as a result of that. So, look, it's convenient for President Trump to pit, pit uh, Americans against immigrants. Um, we shouldn't accept that line of argument, and there, I think there is a much better way here that can, is, more tr is truer to our values, truer to who we are as Americans, and I, and I believe we're going to come out of this presidential campaign reasserting that set of values and creating the, the sense that we all in America are rowing together here, which is how we were before Donald Trump arrived on the scene. And I think we can be there again. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.